This is hardware 301 and choosing database hardware for SQL Server 2019. And this is not just specific to 2019, it's for any version of SQL Server, and it's also for virtualization and even somewhat for the cloud. I mean, you don't have any choice, but you can pick, you know, if you're gonna be on an Azure virtual machine or Azure SQL database, depending on what pricing model you use, you do have some choice over what you pick. So I think this is relevant for almost any environment you wanna ever run SQL Server in. And I'm Glenn Berry, I work for SQLSkills.com, and if you've probably seen this all week, please silence your cell phones, we'll run through that. And then PASS has a lot of good stuff, there's virtual chapters, there's SQL Saturdays, and of course the PASS Summit, so there's a lot of good stuff from PASS. And this is my yay me slide, and why this is important, it's got my email address on there, and it's got my Twitter handle. How many people are on Twitter? Maybe, maybe half of you. Well, for the rest of you, Twitter is actually a really good resource to get involved in the SQL Server community. And they have the SQL help hashtag. So if you have a technical question, instead of just searching for the answer on Google or putting it on some forum somewhere and waiting hours or days to get an answer, you can post a question on Twitter and put SQL help as the hashtag and you'll get answers within seconds sometimes from really smart people because they just follow that hashtag. And if it's something really involved and deep, you could just put a link to a forum post and you'll get more visibility from that. And it's just seriously a good way to network and get to know people in the community. And it's actually how I got my job at SQL Skills, sort of, because Paul Randall tweeted, who's gonna be the next employee at SQL Skills? <clears throat> and I DM'd him and said, me. And he already knew me, you know, but we started talking, but that's seriously how that happened. So anyways, this is my brewing cart. You already heard me talk about that. And that's what some of my beer looks like. And then I win a lot of medals at competitions because I enter lots of local brewing competitions in the Colorado area. So it's just something I enjoy doing. All right, so what we're gonna talk about today is why is database hardware important? Because I know you know, I'll give my DMV talks in the big rooms and have hundreds of people, and I give this talk and there's not as many people. I appreciate you all being here. But lots of people, DBAs, are just not interested in hardware. That's not their job, it's infrastructure. And you know, it's so complicated and nerdy, and I don't care about that, but it actually is really important to us DBAs, and you should be involved in choosing your hardware. And if you didn't, you should, dig into what you have so you know whether it's good or bad and you can take the appropriate actions. And we're gonna go through how do you go about selecting your hardware. And I'm gonna talk quite a bit probably about Intel versus AMD because for a long time I used to joke and say that you know, AMD was so bad and I would badmouth them pretty heavily in years past and I would make jokes about they probably have a contract out on me because I'm always saying bad stuff about them, but now things are quite different. And so that's really good for us. There's very healthy competition between Intel and AMD. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the difference between capacity and performance and why you should care, and talk about the importance of processor selection and how you go about picking the right processor to get the most performance and scalability while minimizing your SQL Server license costs because it's very, very easy, it's actually quite common, to spend much more money, orders of magnitudes in some cases, on your licenses than you do on the hardware itself. And then I'm gonna show you a few things that are coming down the pike in the next 12 to 18 months that you might wanna pay attention to. So, database hardware is a mission critical asset that if your hardware is running poorly, people tend to notice you know, you all know what DBA really stands for. It's default blame acceptor, right? And whenever anything's running slowly, it's blamed on the database, and the hardware could be a big part of that. And if somebody chose your hardware and they did a really bad job, you're stuck dealing with that on a day-to-day -day basis, and it just makes your life a lot more difficult. And also, not only might maybe they gave up performance and scalability, they also could have just made a poor choice that made you spend a lot more than you needed to for SQL Server license costs. And that's good for Microsoft's stock price, but you, know, you wasted money that you didn't need to probably. And old hardware is bad. 
Don't make the mistake that I see a lot of organizations do. If you're getting ready to upgrade to SQL Server 2019, don't reuse your old server from two or three or four years ago. And you might have your management saying, well, yeah, we spent $30,000, $40,000 on that. It's still under warranty. Just, let's just use that server. Really try to fight that urge because you're going to miss out on all the new developments since you had that new server back then. Plus, that encourages you and your organization to do silly things like upgrading in place if you don't have any new hardware to migrate to. If you can just get at least one new server and you can get it all set up and configured and then you can fail over to it with a very short downtime, that's a lot more, less stressful than trying to upgrade in place or frantically reinstalling over the weekend, kind of a thing like a lot of people try to do. And SQL Server is very hardware intensive, so it doesn't make sense to try to save a small amount of money on hardware because SQL Server licenses are so expensive and you want to get the most performance you can for those license costs. So I don't want to say that, oh yeah, the best hardware is going to take care of all your problems because really poorly written queries and terrible applications will completely overwhelm the very best hardware and storage. But having good hardware and storage gives you more margin for error and more breathing room. And then if you've done a good job of tuning everything and you have a good application, it's just going to be even faster on good hardware, right? And nobody's ever come to me and said, hey, the, the database is too fast. Have you ever heard that? You know, they always complain that it's too slow, but having the best hardware just helps in every possible way. So how do you actually go about picking hardware? Well, the first thing, you should think about what kind of a workload do you actually have? Is it more of an OLTP workload? Is it more of a data, house reporting, data warehouse reporting workload? Or is it some sort of mix of that? Because that's going to have an effect on what kind of hardware you pick and what kind of storage you pick and how you configure it. And you don't have to guess. How many people have ever used my DMV diagnostic queries? Uh, quite a few of you. OK, that's good. Well, the rest of you should get with the program. But seriously, there's a, a small subset of my queries that you can run on your existing server. And then you can get a really good idea. You're not guessing. You can tell you know, how hard it's working from a CPU perspective and a memory perspective and how it's doing from an I.O. perspective. And you can actually measure like how many reads and writes you're getting and, and have a good way of going about characterizing your workload. And then you need to think about, is this going to be a bare metal server or is it going to be a virtualization host? Because what I see happening a lot is that if you're going to be virtualizing, which is fine, what people like to do is they want to get a great big server with, say, four sockets and as many cores as possible. And when you do that, you're going to get slower cores. And that's worse for SQL Server OLTP performance. So what I always try to fight, if I can, is say, well, if, we, if we're going to virtualize SQL Server, let's try to maybe get a dedicated SQL Server host for that that has a lower core count, higher clock speed processor than the one you normally use for virtualizing web servers, for example. You know, try to make that argument. You might not win, because they might say, well, all of our virtualization hosts are going to be the same model server, and they're all identical. But at least try to make the fight that SQL Server is different because of the high licensing costs. All right, so the next thing you're going to think about is what form factor do you want to use? And maybe you don't have any choice in the matter, but you have three basic choices, a rack mount server, a blade server, or a tower server. And a lot of times, IT organizations want to push you into using a, a blade server. And personally, I don't really like that for SQL Server because a lot of times that decreases your flexibility. You might not have as many memory slots or as many PCIe slots for storage. And also, all those blades are in a single enclosure that sometimes shares things like networking and storage resources. Plus, that enclosure can be a single point of failure. So if you've got multiple blades in the same enclosure, and maybe they're different sides of an HA topology, and if that enclosure goes down, everything goes down. So typically, I don't like blade servers. I really prefer rack mount servers. And tower servers are better for smaller organizations that maybe don't have a full-on 
uh, IT department or they don't have a server room with you know, cold and hot aisles. So a lot of smaller businesses will use tower servers, but they usually, in most cases, don't have hot swappable components like rat mount servers. So they're not usually the best choice for SQL Server. The other thing you gotta think about is how many rack units do you want for your rack mounted server? Do you want a 1U or a 2U or something bigger? And what I try to prefer, because a lot of times you'll see the same model server essentially in a 1U model and a 2U model, and it's either one socket or two sockets, for example. Well, go for the higher one if you can for SQL Server because that gives you more space in the server for things like internal drives and PCI expansion cards. So it just gives you more flexibility for SQL Server than if you use a one use server. The other thing you gotta keep an eye on is if you have a 42U rack full of one use servers, you can have problems with how much power you're pulling into that rack and how much heating you get, you know, that you're gonna get out of it. And so it's gonna affect your cooling issues in your data center. So that's another reason to prefer to you, if you can, for SQL Server. So these are all sort of some basic things. And then the next thing you gotta think about, and this has been changing over the years, is how many sockets do you think you need for SQL Server? Because back in the old days, you know, 10 years ago, everybody typically would have a four socket server for SQL Server. And the reason why was that you needed that many sockets to have enough memory capacity and enough processor cores to support your workload. And a lot of people are still in that habit. Well, that's what we did 10 years ago. Let's get a four socket server. And that's usually the wrong answer nowadays because modern two socket servers have more than enough resources from a memory perspective and an I.O. perspective and processor cores to support almost any workload. And you're actually better off with a two socket server than a four socket server. And if you've got a really big workload that won't fit on a single two socket server, which is very rare anymore, well, it's better to get more than one two socket server instead of one four socket server. You'll have more capacity than you would if you had a single four socket server. And what's really starting to be even more common now is getting a one socket server instead of two. So the fewer sockets, the better. Because as you add more sockets, you're gonna have more NUMA overhead. And you might think intuitively that, okay, if I go from a two socket to a four socket, I'm gonna double my capacity. But that's not really true. You don't get linear scaling when you go from two to four sockets. And one thing that I also see people doing is using a two socket server and only populating one socket, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. But the reason I'm harping on this one socket thing is the industry is sort of going in that direction, and it's much more viable now that AMD has their latest generation Epic processors. They're designed to run what used to be a two socket Intel workload on a one socket AMD, and that's something you really should take a look at. So again, what about populating just one socket in a two socket server? You can do that, and that gives you some flexibility where you could add the second socket later, right, and buy more SQL Server licenses if your workload gets bigger. So I've had a lot of clients, oh, let's do that, because we don't want to buy all those licenses now. And if we grow, we have that flexibility to add the second processor in that empty socket. You can do that, but just be aware that you might run into some sort of tricky issues there. First of all, it's gonna cut in half how much memory you can put into the server because you can only have, you know, the memory that's connected to that one processor is gonna be available. So only half your RAM slots can be populated. And the other thing is if you add that second processor, you're not gonna get double the capacity. It'd be more like maybe 80 to 90% more capacity because there's gonna be some NUMA overhead. And then another one that's kind of caught a couple of my clients off guard is how many people have heard of Intel Optane DC persistent memory? Quite a few of you have heard of it, right? And that's where you have these Intel Optane DIMMs that fit in your normal RAM slots, and they can be used for different things. And if you want to use that, a lot of the server vendors, if you only have one socket populated in a two socket server, they won't let you do it. You just disabled, you can't do that. So you have to have both sockets populated if you do wanna do that. All right, this one right here, this slide is really important. 
to keep in mind. This is SQL Server license costs. And I have not seen any documentation online saying that there was a price change from 2017 to 2019. So these are the 2017 prices. And again, I haven't heard that they made a price increase. They didn't go from 2016 to 2017. They didn't increase it. So we'll see. So we're going with these numbers for now. And with standard edition, you have the choice of a server license and CALs if you have a very small amount of users or devices. But with enterprise edition, you have to use core licenses. And you can also use core licenses with standard edition. And of course, the way it works is you have to have a minimum of four core licenses per physical processor or per virtual machine unless you virtualize the entire host and get licenses for that and have SA on top of it. So you just got to pay attention to how many physical cores you have on the machine. And it's also, some people will ask questions like, well, what if I go into the BIOS and disable some cores? That doesn't matter. If it's in the machine, you've got to license every single core for SQL Server. And so you can see that Enterprise Edition is about four times as expensive as Standard Edition. Now, it's still a lot less money than Oracle licenses, but a lot of people have a hard time swallowing that. And so just make sure you're aware of that, that how much it's going to cost for each one of those physical cores. And you get hyper-threading for free on physical machines. You don't pay extra for that. It's only physical cores. So here are the license limits. And this slide is sort of a pet peeve of mine. If you're on Enterprise Edition, everything's good. You can use whatever the OS will support. And if you're on Windows Server 2016 or newer, it's 24 terabytes. So that's way more than most commodity hardware will even support. So there's no problem there. Now, most Linux distributions have lower license limits. It's usually more like 12 terabytes. So be aware of that. But whatever the OS will support and whatever the hardware has, you can use it. So that's great. But the problem is standard edition. How many people have to run standard edition? About half of you. Well, these license limits have been around basically since SQL Server 2008 R2. Now they've been slowly increasing them as new versions come out. But I was very disappointed, I'll be honest with you, that they did not raise them when they went from 2016 to 2017, and then they didn't raise them again when they went from 2017 to 2019. So you're limited to 128 gigabytes per instance for standard edition, plus a little bit more for column store and in-memory OLTP. And so you get a little bit more than that. And that's all you can do per instance. So if you go out and buy a server and throw a terabyte of RAM in it, you're only going to be used a small portion of it for standard edition. Now, one way to get around that is to have multiple instances on the same machine. And you could use processor affinity to try to split it everything evenly across the machine. But that's kind of a pain in the neck. So that's one issue. But the bigger issue is that you're limited to the lesser of four sockets or 24 physical cores. And I see a lot of people getting bit by this. So they go out and buy a brand new two socket server and it's got two 16 core processors in it, for example. So they have 32 physical cores and that two socket machine. And if you do that and you install SQL Server Standard Edition on that machine, what's going to happen is that it's going to use all 16 cores on the first socket and then only eight on the second socket. So it's going to be unbalanced. And I've had a lot of clients that were just running that way and didn't even realize it. And their performance was pretty bad. And you can go in and run an alter server configuration command to balance it so you have 12 and 12. But those other ones that the OS sees, SQL Server won't use because of this license limit. And not only that, Microsoft actually expects you to pay for those cores that you can't even use. And you could probably fight them on that, but that's their unofficial written position, I should say. So just don't do that. If you know you're going to be on standard edition, don't get a machine that has more than 24 physical cores, or else you're going to have a problem. And this also comes into play with virtualization. If you go in and create a VM, make sure the VM doesn't have more than four sockets, and make sure it doesn't have more than 24 cores, or you're going to have the same problem. So just keep your eye on that. Yes? <laughs> 
No. No, what I actually, the question that I, it was hyper-threading not available on VMs, no, that, that's not actually what I said. What I said is that licensing is based on physical cores, not logical cores for bare metal. Now, if you're running a VM, it counts vCPUs, you know, virtual CPUs. So if you have hyper-threading enabled on the host, then they're going to show up, and if you give, say, four virtual CPUs to a VM, they're going to be tied to logical CPUs. And actually, what I usually recommend to people, if you know you're going to have a dedicated virtualization host for SQL Server only, you might want to disable hyper-threading on the host. And that way, all those virtual CPUs tie to physical cores instead of logical cores. And you're going to get more performance. And you'll, you'll lose about 25% of the capacity of the host. But I would rather do that. And plus, another reason you might want to do that, there's been a lot of security issues with hyper-threading lately. And, there, and some hyperscalers will tell you, if you want to be as secure as possible, you should disable hyper-threading from a security point of view. And this is only on Intel, by the way. AMD doesn't have this problem. And we'll get more into that later. So, OK. Okay. Well, not, well, just things have changed. So the question is, am I recommending only single socket instead of dual socket? That's not quite what I said. I said you should prefer that if you can, because then there's no NUMA overhead, potentially. Now, with current AMD processors, even a single socket is going to have two NUMA nodes that show up. but. Reducing the number of sockets just reduces the latency. And the reason this is an issue, with NUMA, non-uniform memory access, you've got, say, two sockets. And each processor has access to its local memory very fast. It's, and then you can go to the other socket, and it's foreign memory access, and it's a lot slower, much higher latency. So if you really care about memory performance and getting the lowest latency, you don't want that. So a single socket is better. And the problem is, most Intel-based servers, they have single socket solutions, but they're based on glorified desktop processors. They don't have enough capacity. So like they max out at eight cores and 64 gigs of RAM, for example. And that's just not big enough. But now, with the AMD Epic servers, you can get 64 cores in a single socket and four terabytes in one socket. And that's more than enough for a lot of workloads. So the point is, like the, the CTO of Dell wrote this really good article a couple months ago talking about the future is single socket servers. So again, back 10 years ago, everybody used four socket, and then we've been trained to use two sockets. And now I'm saying, start thinking about one socket. So that's my point, OK? So this slide is, OK, what's the biggest commodity server you can get? And that would be an eight socket server. You can get bigger, but it's kind of difficult and hardly anybody sells them. So commodity is an eight socket server. And so Fujitsu has a model called the Prime Quest 3800B. And so you could load that thing with eight top of the line, most expensive Intel Platinum processors. And if you did that, how much would this thing cost? Just to scare everybody a little bit. So, if you did this, it would end up being $1.8 million for the hardware and the SQL Server licenses. But look at the cost breakdown. So first of all, if you don't know this, Windows Server 2016 moved to core-based licensing. And you might think, oh, no, not, not again, right? But luckily, it's very affordable. And that's another thing I want to throw out there. There's no need for probably 99% of the people out there to get data center edition for the OS. Get standard edition, because it has all the same capacities and features. The only thing you're losing out on is you can't use it for storage spaces direct, and you have less virtualization rights. But that's the two main differences. So save a lot of money and get standard edition licenses, and they're very affordable. So you're going to have 224 core licenses for the OS. And then you've got to buy eight of those processors, and they're expensive. 
they're $17,000 a piece for that particular processor. And then you've got to buy 12 terabytes of RAM, and luckily RAM prices have been going down big time over the last 12 to 18 months. It's down to about five to six dollars per gigabyte, and that's great. And then, that's the killer, is the SQL Server licenses. So you can see how much that is. It's 89% of the total. And this doesn't count any storage. It's just, you know, the major parts of the server. All right, so a more typical two-socket server that most of us would probably be using would be something like a Dell PowerEdge 740 with two much lower end processors. And by lower end, I mean fewer cores. This is actually a very fast processor that I highly recommend for a lot of people, the Xeon Gold 6244. And so the breakdown on that is quite a bit different because you only have 16 physical cores you have to license for the OS and for SQL Server, and you only put 512 gigs of RAM in this thing, in this case. So this is only $123,000, including the SQL Server licenses, and you can see that SQL Server is 92% of the total. So that's just keeping that in mind, those SQL Server licenses costs are driving most of your costs. All right, Intel versus AMD. So in years past, I would always say that AMD was terrible for SQL Server, and the reason why is because it had terrible single-threaded performance. And also, about the time that SQL Server 2012 was released, what was the big thing that happened in SQL Server 2012 that upset a lot of people? Anybody remember? Remember it was core-based licensing? Remember the good old days, if you're old enough, that SQL Server 2008 R2 and older was processor-based license. So you could buy that processor license and then you could get as many cores as you wanted and you didn't pay anything extra. So the more cores, the better. It was party time. But then in 2012, they switched to core-based licensing and just about the time that happened is when AMD released their first Opteron processors that had 16 cores. So it was really expensive to license them and they were really slow. And it was so bad that Microsoft threw a bone to AMD, and they used to have this thing called the core factor table. It was a little PDF document from Microsoft, and it had a list. Okay, if you buy any of these AMD processors on this list, we'll give you a 25% license discount. But even with that discount, it was still a terrible deal. So I would always tell people, no, don't get AMD. It's really bad. But now things are changing, thank goodness. So what's happening right now is that Intel still has a, a relatively small single-threaded performance advantage compared to AMD, and that's important for OLTP workloads. But AMD has the advantage for multi-threaded performance, which ties to capacity. They also have higher memory density, and they have a lot more PCIe lanes, and they're Gen 4 instead of Gen 3, so you get double the bandwidth. And Intel processors are quite a bit more expensive than AMD processors. Now, to be honest, that's not a huge deal because, again, your license costs are driving it, but still, it can add up in some cases. And then the other thing you need to think about is Intel has a lot more processor-related security exploits that we know about. And so this is actually a big deal for some places. They're just getting sick of this, that it seems like every month or two, some big new exploit you know, goes public and you've got to go in and patch something or update your firmware. And quite often, you take a performance hit when you go and protect your system to mitigate these processor vulnerabilities. And since AMD has a completely different architecture, and also probably to be honest, since they have such a small market share in the past, they ha and they're not a big target, so they just not have, have not, not have been attacked as much as Intel has, and they're more secure. So here's what Intel has in their favor. They have higher clock speeds because they're running on the 14 nanometer manufacturing process, which is very mature and very optimized, and they can get very high clock speeds, and that helps single-threaded performance. And they also have AVX 512 support and DL Boost support, which is really more for machine learning and certain specialized things. And SQL Server doesn't use either one of those. But if you are doing that sort of stuff, that can be very helpful. 
And also, Intel has Optane PMEM support, so persistent memory support. If you want that, you have to have a current generation Intel Cascade Lake processor. Nothing else supports that yet. And then if you do use that PMEM, your D regular DRAM is gonna slow down. A lot of people don't know this. So the latest Cascade Lake processors can run their memory at 2933, and it's gonna slow down to 2666. So you take about a 10% hit on your memory speed. So just make sure you realize that. So because of all this, Intel is still better for OLTP workloads. And they still control about 95, 90 to 95% of the market right now. You know, a couple of years ago, they controlled 99% of the market, and AMD is clawing back market share pretty quickly. And so here's the current Intel server processor families. And the first one is if you're gonna have a very small workload and you want the absolute fastest performance you can get, you might get a single socket solution that uses that Xeon E family, which is Coffee Lake, the architecture. And it's the E2200 series. And these go up to eight physical cores plus hyper-threading. And I believe they go to 256 gigs of RAM now. So you can run a pretty decent workload on that. But for a lot of people, that's not gonna be big enough. So if you need to go bigger, what most people end up doing is using the second generation Xeon scalable family otherwise known as Cascade Lake SP. And this came out last summer. So it's the latest and greatest from Intel. And just to confuse everybody, what they did back in the previous generation scalable family is they changed their naming standard completely. And so instead of saying Xeon E5 or E7 like they used to, now, They've got all these different little subfamilies. So they have the bronze family and the silver family, and actually two different gold families, and then two different platinum families. So your cheat sheet here is do not ever use bronze or silver for SQL Server, because those are the entry level families that you give up a huge amount of performance to save a tiny amount of money on the hardware. And it just doesn't make sense for SQL Server. So if you or your server admins thinking, oh, we're gonna get that silver processor and save 500 bucks, don't do it. It's a huge mistake. You're gonna give up so much performance, you'll regret it. Where you wanna be, for most people, is one of the gold families or the platinum if you need to go to an eight socket server because you need that for eight socket server support. And then the other thing you might have heard of is they have this other one called the Platinum 92XX family that goes up to 56 cores. And Intel likes to brag, or they did, oh yeah, we've got a 56 core processor. But that thing has a lot of limitations because basically they took two of their regular ones and glued them together. And it's not being sold by any of the big vendors. It's a specialized solution meant mainly for machine learning and AI kind of stuff. And it doesn't support Intel PMEM, for example. And it uses a huge amount of power. And it's, it's so expensive, they won't even list the price. And you know that's a bad deal, right? If you go to somebody who's trying to sell you something, and you look on their website, and they're like, call us for pricing. That's bad. You know it's expensive. So don't even think about Cascade Lake AP. So this is the Intel server processor family tree going back all the way to 2008. And the reason I like to show this slide is this kind of helps you figure out, okay, how old are my processors? How many generations back am I? So you might recognize some of those things there. And what Intel used to do for about 10 years, but they had to stop, was something called the TikTok release cycle. So every two years, they'd release a new microarchitecture called with a, a talk. And then they would take that same architecture and do a process shrink in different fabrication plants that cost billions of dollars and, and shrink it. So they went from 45 nanometers to 32, and then they came out with a talk and went to at 32, and they shrank that to 22. So every two years would be a talk, and then the intervening year would be a tick. And this was very predictable, and you could use it for planning purposes. And it, it worked great until about 2016. And does anybody know why did they have to stop doing that? 
Physics, yeah. That's part of it, definitely. Back in the back. Yeah. And so what he said is, you know, you can see if you look closely, see how it would go, you know, two lines and then shrink, two lines and shrink. And then now it's been stuck at 14. And originally Intel was going to have 10 nanometer in late 2015, early 2016 was their plan. And they still don't have it. And it's five years later. And they really blew it because they just dominated the market. They had or an absolute monopoly during this period. But they haven't been able to move to 10 nanometers. So they had to abandon the TikTok and they have something now called process architecture optimization. And it's, yeah, Intel is struggling there. So anyways, getting back to what we're at now, you can see towards the bottom that the platinum and gold and silver came out in 2017. That was the first generation scalable processors. And now we have the second generations. And they're still on 14 nanometers. And what's supposed to happen early next year is that we're going to have Cooper Lake in the first half. And it'll still be 14 nanometers. And it's going to require new model servers because you, you would use the same model server from Sky Lake to Cascade Lake with a BIOS update. And it's not like you would go and replace your processor. You just buy the new one, it would come with a new processor. So you're going to have to get like a, a Dell PowerEdge 750, for example, I'm just guessing, next year when Cooper Lake comes out. And then towards the second half of the year, they're supposed to release Ice Lake, which is going to be 10 nanometers and have DDR4 support and a few other good things under DDR. I take that back, PCIe 4.0 support they're going to have. And hopefully they make that, because that's the other problem. They've been missing their dates. And they've been very reluctant to release roadmaps. You know? But hopefully, they're going to turn it around. And, and it's not like Intel's going to go out of business. They have, they're 10 times as big as AMD. And they've got plenty of resources. But they're struggling right now. And that's good for us, because there's healthy competition. So, Here's an example of what I'm talking about. How many people have heard of the TPCE benchmark? Most of you have. Well, for the rest of you, it's an OLTP benchmark that's been out there since 2007, and there's nothing but SQL Server results in it because the database vendors have veto power. So if somebody like Dell wanted to do a TPCE on Oracle, Oracle has to give them the OK, and, and they never have. So there's nothing but SQL Server results in there. And it's very good for comparing different processors. Whenever a new generation processor comes out, the server vendors will release some new benchmarks. And plus, usually, whenever a new version of SQL Server comes out, they'll do that. But they haven't done it yet for 2019. But I talked to Slava Oaks yesterday, and he says that there's probably going to be some. But he wouldn't say when. So it's in progress. So anyways, this is telling us that on the left is a Intel Xeon system, the latest flagship release. And this is a two socket server with two 28 core processors. So you have 58 co 56 cores in the system and a terabyte and a half of RAM. And so the top line score is 7,012.53. So that's a measure of the capacity of the system for an OLTP workload. And that system costs $638,000, including the SQL Server licenses and the storage. And that link takes you to the TPCE website. And on the right is a one socket AMD system with one 64 core processor and slightly less memory, but faster memory. And you can see that the score is about 5% lower. But also, if you're paying attention, you, you see that it's 64 cores versus 56 cores. So what I usually like to do is I take that top line score and divide it by the number of cores, and that gives you a score per core measure, which is your single thread of performance. So by the time you do that, you're looking at 10 to 15% lower. And so it is slower, I, I won't lie. But it's, the gap is closed up much more than it used to be. And you have other reasons you might want to pick AMD, but if you want the absolute best OLTP performance, Intel is still slightly better, OK? So in case you don't know about Intel Optane DC persistent memory, they've got two different ways you can use it. And one way I would not recommend you use for SQL Server. So the one on the left is called memory mode. 
and that's meant for legacy workloads. And what they mean is you don't have to go in and modify your application. You have to, you can just use this with like SQL Server 2005 if you wanted to. And what this does is you take some of your memory slots and take the regular DRAM out and put PMEM in there instead. And these PMEM modules can be up to 512 gigabytes, which is huge. And then it makes it look like you've got more memory in the system. But the problem with that is even though this is really fast, it's not as fast as DRAM. So for most people, you'd be better off to have more DRAM instead of less DRAM and then have PMEM there instead. And when you do this, your actual DRAM acts as a cache in front of the PMEM to try to make it perform as well. So, you know, and I've talked to some people at Microsoft and the testing that, that they've done that this does not work that well for SQL Server for if you use memory mode. What's more interesting is the one in the middle, app direct mode. And that's where you can set up PMEM that is non-volatile and you can use it as very, very fast storage. And there's different ways of doing that, like with hybrid buffer pool in SQL Server 2019, or you can do things like tail to log caching, persistent log buffer, even back in 2016. So that's more interesting for SQL Server, okay? So here's AMD's performance advantages. You have higher IPC, which is instructions per clock, because this is on, AMD is on a more modern architecture and a more modern manufacturing process. So they're running more efficiently. Their problem is they, they can't push the clock speed up as high yet. Because when you go from say 14 nanometers to seven nanometers, your clock speeds go down initially. They can't just use the same clock speed because they're worried about how much heat is being dissipated and things like that. And you have a much more modern architecture that's modular with AMD and you have a much larger L3 cache and you have faster memory and more memory channels. And then the, a big one, especially for data warehouse workloads, is you've got PCIe version four instead of version three, which is double the bandwidth. And that's huge. If you're a data warehouse workload or you wanna get backups running in just a, a minute or two instead of hours, this kind of thing is really important. And so AMD CPUs are much better suited for data warehouse workloads or anywhere where you really care about sequential throughput, both from the storage and from the memory. Anybody remember the old fast track data warehouse program that Microsoft used to have out there? And they would partner with people like Dell and HPE and say, okay, if you wanna go buy a five terabyte data warehouse, here's what you should do. And they would tell you, get this hardware and this storage and give you all the configuration settings and they would tune it so everything was balanced. Well, that kind of thing is a lot easier to do with an AMD server because you've got so much memory bandwidth and so much storage bandwidth. And this is also good for just a general purpose virtualization host because 64 cores and four terabytes of memory and a single socket server it gives you a lot of uh, VMs. All right, so here's the AMD server processor tree. And I just built this slide fairly recently, but this goes back to 2010 when the first Opterons came out that had high core counts. And hopefully nobody has any of these old Opterons still running in production because they were just miserable for SQL Server. They were terrible. I feel sorry for you if you ever had to work with them. They were so slow. But then what happened in 2017, AMD came out with the Zen architecture and they had it for client first, you know, desktop clients and then high-end desktop and they introduced it in the server space. So the first generation was called Naples and it was the Zen architecture. And then they released Zen 2 uh, last year and that's Rome and that's the Epic 7002 series. And then you can see going out in the future, they're supposed to release Zen 3 in the middle of next year. So they're, they're not wasting any time. Every year, pretty much, they're pushing out a new generation of this, and then they're gonna have Zen 4 probably in 2021 on five nanometers. So they're just rushing ahead because they've got this window of opportunity to gain a whole bunch of market share from Intel if they don't mess it up. So that's what a Rome processor looks like, and that's Lisa Su, the CEO, holding it. So 
That's kind of a famous picture. But what you, what's interesting about this, at least to me, is in the center, you have an I.O. die that takes care of all of your I.O., and then those eight other ones around it are chiplets where your processor cores are. And each one of those can have up to eight cores. So eight times eight is 64. And they've done this in such a way that they can add more and more in the future very easily, because what Intel's still doing is a monolithic. One chip has everything, and all the cores and all the I.O. and everything is in that one chip, and they have a harder time doing that from a manufacturing perspective. So here's the Zen architecture roadmap. So you had Zen and then Zen Plus, which was 12 nanometers, and that didn't happen on the server side. And then Zen 2 is what we have now, and Zen 3 is what's coming out in the middle of next year. And so they're being much more uh, open about their roadmap, and they're hitting their marks because they know they've got this little window of opportunity to catch up to Intel. And again, this is good for us. We don't want one company to totally dominate because then they can do whatever they want and get lazy and not release things like they should. So here's an actual TPC-H result comparison. And on the left is an Intel system. And unfortunately, you got to be careful. Everybody know what TPC-H is? It's the data warehouse benchmark where TPC-E is the OLTP benchmark. So with TPC-H, you've got to go in and look at what's called the scale factor. How big is the data warehouse they were using for the test? And they have different sizes. So this one was a one terabyte data warehouse. It's not that big, but you need to make sure you compare results that are using the same size database. So these are both the closest ones I could find that use a one terabyte database. And what, what's going on here is you've got a two socket Intel on the left versus a one socket AMD on the right. And you might notice, well, hey, Glenn, you told me that this is better for AMD, but the score is lower. Well, what's going on here? Anybody see what's happening? So I think what I might have heard is, well, the one on the left has two sockets and 56 cores, and the one on the right has one socket and only 32 cores. You know, it's not quite as high, but it has a lot fewer cores, and you could <laughs> have more cores if you want. And remember, you can go all the way to 64 cores in one socket on AMD. So what I did is I took the top line score, that 1 million and 9 on the left, and divided it by 56 cores to give me the QPHH per core, right? So it's 18,000 and 19 on the left. And then on the right, I did the same thing. Since there's only 32 cores, it's actually quite a bit higher, about 30% higher. And this is evidence on the exact same benchmark that AMD does better for a data warehouse workload, at least with this benchmark, than Intel does. Yes? Yes, it does. Because that's where you see, and remember, it's only 32 cores on the right versus 56 on the left. So, Again, for data warehouse workloads, AMD is a very good choice. And, and again, you know, I don't work for AMD, even though it might sound like it right now. But if you do have a data warehouse workload, give AMD you know, a chance, because they might be a much better solution for you than Intel right now, because of this, all this new stuff that's happened. All right, so here's what you could get on a two socket server with AMD, 256 threads on two sockets. That's pretty incredible. So I just like showing that picture for no particular reason. And then this is what their architecture looks like. And again, that picture where Lisa Sue is holding up the processor, you see the I.O. die in the middle, and then you see the chiplets with the processor cores on either side. And then they're out, you know, you can just see how this works. And, and the beauty of this is they can easily add more, and they can change how many they have in each one of them. So it's completely modular. And it's easier for them to manufacture, and it's less expensive to do it this way. All right, so here is a cost comparison of these different processors. So on the top, you've got some selected AIM, uh, Intel processors that I picked out. So the very top, one thing you may not realize is that, see that L 
on the Intel Xeon Platinum at the top. So it's 8280L and then 8280M be below that. Those little suffixes mean that it has higher memory support. Because normally, you can only have up to one terabyte of memory in each socket with the regular with no suffix. So Intel charges you a lot of money to increase the memory support. Look at the difference, 17,900 versus 10,000 for the same number of cores. And the only difference is the memory support. And that's called product segmentation. That's something Intel does a lot. They go in and do things like cripple certain features, and then they make you pour, pay extra to get it non-crippled. And AMD doesn't do that. Everything is just unlocked and, and released instead of segmented that way. So anyways, you can see the difference in cost here. And I also did a calculation, what is the cost per physical core? And you can see at the top, $639 for that top of the line, most expensive one they make, compared to AMD, their most expensive one's only $108 per core, so six times more per core. And this you know, can be pretty significant, although remember, your SQL Server license costs are gonna far outweigh this. But still, this is, can be significant. So you can see that you have different core counts and the prices go down as you have fewer cores essentially in both families. But in all cases, AMD is less money. And you can see that even the low core count, very inexpensive AMD processors still support four terabytes of memory. Yep. Yeah, I, I think I have that coming up in a subsequent slide, so, yep. All right, so here's a cost comparison of, of a system. So what I did here is I just went to the Dell website a week or so ago, and just, you know, you can go and pick all your components and everything and build a system. So I built a two-socket Dell R740 with two Intel Platinum processors and a terabyte of RAM, and so I just showed you how much would that server cost. So it was $63,000, you know, retail price. And everybody should know that if you are getting really to buy a new server, you know, and you go to your sales rep at Dell, you'll probably pay 20, 30% less than retail. But this is the retail price, okay? So 56 licenses you had to get, and that was $399,000. So the system would cost $462,000, not counting the storage. And then on the right is, a Dell R7515, which is their new model that supports Rome fully, the latest AMD processor. And this is a one socket server with a 60 core, 64 core processor and the same amount of memory. And everything else is identical as much as I could make it. And you can see that it costs about half the price for the hardware. And you still get more cores which is actually more expensive for SQL Server because you gotta license all of them. So that's why the total cost is slightly more because of the SQL Server licenses. But you could get around that with virtualization. If you had a hypervisor, you wouldn't have to license all those cores. So it's up to you how you wanna handle that. So that's for a pretty big system. And then here's the same thing for a smaller system like most of us would use. And you can see in this case, the Dell with the Intel servers is a little bit more expensive, about $5,000 more, but it ends up being more overall because it's 18 physical cores instead of 32. So again, you gotta pay attention to these details so you're not surprised by what happens. And just keep in mind that the SQL Server license costs are gonna dwarf everything else, and you wanna try to minimize that as much as you can. So, how many people have heard of Meltdown and Spectra and Foreshadow and Zombie Load? These are some of the processor-related exploits that have come out over the last pretty much two years. You know, the big watershed here was, I remember I was actually at the Big Beers in Belgian Beer Festival in January of 2018 in Breckenridge, and then the news came out about Meltdown and Spectra. So I was like frantically in my hotel room trying to write a blog post about it, right? Because it was a big deal. You know, Intel and Microsoft and AMD had known about it for a while and then it went public and they had to frantically try to get a hold of the story and get patches out as quickly as they could. So there's been a whole bunch of processor security vulnerabilities in the last two years that we know about and this is just a list of some of them. 
So the latest one that I've heard about is called NetCat, Network Cache Attack, and it attacks your networking portions. So Data Directed I.O. is what DDIO stands for, and RDMA is Remote Direct Memory Access that's used in some high-end NICs for things like Storage Spaces Direct and Virtualization Hosts, and that's an Intel-only vulnerability that needs to be patched. Zombie Load is a side-channel attack that exploits hyper-threading on Intel only, and some hyperscalers will just tell you, if you want to be secure, you should just disable hyper-threading. There's no other way to fix it. And then some people will say, well, don't worry about it. And, and Microsoft has some official guidance on it so that I have a link to on the next page. And then you have Foreshadow is another one that attacks VMs and SGS, SGX enclaves that VMs can use for security. Well, it attacks that, and that's Intel only. And then Meltdown was Intel only. The only one that AMD was affected by was Spectra, and they were not as affected as Intel was. So my point here is that AMD processors are more secure than Intel processors. And and what makes this even worse is that they try to patch this with firmware updates and OS updates and SQL Server updates in some cases. Quite often, this affects your performance in a very noticeable way, especially for meltdown fixes. So, you know, you're paying this price for all these security vulnerabilities from a performance point of view. And this is the guidance that I talked about earlier. So, Microsoft has a really nice page that lays out, okay, here's what all these things are, and here's what you might want to do if you're running SQL Server, depending on how you're running it and how worried you are about security. And they give you all the different things you need to think about. And then the next link is for Windows Server. So if you want to be even more secure, you've got to go and get patches for SQL Server, not SQL Server, but for the OS. And then you've got to actually enable registry entries to enable them. And then AMD and Intel both have guidance. And then the last link is just a pretty good article that talks about all these different exploits and whether Intel or AMD is more secure. All right, so the next one is capacity versus performance. And server capacity is basically just a measure of how much concurrent workload can your server handle. So in that case, it's CPU capacity is your multi-threaded performance. And then your memory capacity is how much memory can you have in the server and what's your total sequential throughput. And then IO capacity basically relates to how many PCIe lanes do you have and what generation is it? And that's really important. A lot of people don't think about that, but that's how you're going to get data in and out of that server and how your storage is going to be utilized. So those are different aspects of the capacity of the server. So that's one thing to think about, because people tend to get confused, I find, between capacity and performance. So this is what capacity means. So you know, a big, pretty Peterbilt truck can hold a lot of stuff in it, but it that's, maybe it doesn't go that fast. So that's your capacity, right? And then performance is your single-threaded performance from a CPU perspective. And then your memory speed and latency and then things like I.O. latency, so things that, how long is this query going to take to come back? That's more performance than capacity, right? And so how fast is that single-threaded query going to come back that you have with your OLTP workload? How fast can you read and write from the buffer pool or from storage? That's performance, and that's what a lot of people tend to notice. And this is going to be the same whether you're under load or not, unless you're under such a load that this starts to suffer also. So this is more like a Tesla Model 3 performance. And these things are so fast, they scare you. But this is performance instead of capacity. So in the back. OK. Yeah, well, the slides should be up already, hopefully. But for those of you taking pictures, but you, you're welcome to take pictures. So anyways, and that's the same color my Tesla is, by the way. That's the exact Tesla that I have. So it's not my Tesla, but mine looks just like that. So anyways, this is some more comparisons from a capacity point of view between AMD and Intel. So the Epic 7002 is the latest AMD that I've been talking about, and Cascade Lake is the latest Intel. And so 
you can get 64 cores versus 28 in one processor. And then you can have 128 PCIe lanes instead of 48. And they're Gen 4, so they have twice the bandwidth. So a lot more bandwidth. And then your memory is a little bit faster. And you have more of it. But you don't have Intel Optane DC PMEM support. You only get that with Intel. So if that's important to you, you're going to have to go Intel. Now, while I'm on that subject, you've probably heard of Optane quite a bit, right? But there's different kinds of Optane. It's just a brand. And they use it for a lot of different products. So what I've been talking about so far is Intel DC persistent memory that only works with this one kind of Intel processor. But you also have Intel Optane storage. And that works with any kind of processor. And I have a lot of clients using that. And it works really well. So the product that people are using is called the Intel Optane DC P4800X. It's a PCIe card in most cases that goes up to one and a half terabytes. And it's much, much faster than NAND flash storage. Has much lower latency and much better performance under a heavy workload. It's incredible for TempDB. If you've got a really brutal TempDB workload and you have it on flash storage and it's still not performing, this is much better. And the reason I said flash storage like that is that a lot of times people will come up to me and say, well, I've got all flash storage, so everything's great, right? Well, there's lots of different kinds of flash storage. You know, the worst kind of flash storage that a lot of people actually have would be SATA flash storage using AHCI and two and a half inch drives like you probably have in your laptop. That is much, much worse than more modern NVMe storage using PCIe that has much, much higher performance. And then not only that, whether it's read intensive or write intensive or mixed use NAND flash, all these details matter. So don't let just somebody say, oh, I've got flash storage. It's all good. It makes a big difference what kind. So Here's another little chart that I think is interesting. It shows you on a processor, you've got the registers that are actually doing some work, and then you've got an L1 cache, and an L2 cache, and an L3 cache on the processor. And you can see what happens to the latency. And in an ideal situation, you're going to find what you're looking for in a query in the L1 cache. But the problem is the L1 cache is very tiny, and the chances of that happening are not too good. And as you go out to the L2 cache, it gets bigger, but the latency goes up a lot. And then L3 cache is even more. But that's still pretty incredible if you find it in the L3 cache. And then it shows you local memory access on the same NUMA node and remote access on a different NUMA node. It's almost double the latency. And then Optane PMEM access goes up even more. And then Optane SSD, like I just talked about, goes up more. And then NVMe SSD goes up more. And these are all really fast. You know, most of you probably don't have any of this, except for the caches and the local memory. And then you go down to SATA SSDs and then you know, magnetic drives. So it just gets worse and worse and worse. So you want to find your data as high as you can on this chart as possible. All right, so here's the Intel data retrieval pyramid that they like to talk about. So they're showing you memory at the top, and then you have persistent memory beneath that, and then you have Intel Optane storage beneath that, and then regular old-fashioned flash storage underneath that, and then H hard drives and tape beneath that. So you want to be at the top of this if you can. So processor selection. How do you actually compare processors? Well, I like to use those TPCE scores. But the problem with that is that the server vendors only benchmark their flagship top of the line highest core count processor that most of us can't afford. And we can afford the processor, but we can't afford the SQL Server licenses. So what I do is I go and get that official score for that flagship processor, and I just do some simple grade school arithmetic to adjust it for the lower core count processor in the same family, and that's critical. You can't compare across families by doing this. So you got to go and do the calculation against the flagship for your generation, and you can do it for another generation, and then you can compare across them that way. And once you do that, 
you'll get an estimated TPCE score for the system and then a score per core for the system. And this helps you compare processors instead of just guessing, all right? So that's how that works. And let me just show you the math here. So remember in school you had to show your math or you didn't get credit for the problem. What I've got here, and you'll get this document, by the way, but it's an actual TPCE score for a two-socket Lenovo with two of the top-of-the-line Intel processors. And it comes in with that score of 7,012. And what would be the estimated score for that exact same server with two Xeon Gold 6254 that has fewer cores? So basically, you have 28 cores in this one and 18 cores in this one. And the base clock speed of the bigger one is 2.7 gigahertz, and the base clock speed is 3.1 gigahertz on this one, all right? So what do you do is the core count adjustment is 18 divided by 28, and the clock speed adjustment is 3.1 divided by 2.7. So you get those, and then here's what you do. You take the real actual score and multiply it by the core count adjustment, and you multiply that times the clock speed adjustment, and you get the estimated score for that other processor that has fewer cores. Does that make sense? And this is giving us an estimate of what that thing would do in terms of capacity. So that's a good way of measuring the total CPU capacity of the system. And then you take that estimated score down here, and you also take the actual score here and divide about how many physical cores are in the system, and this gives you that score per core. And this is a measure of the single-threaded performance of the processor. And remember, with an OLTP workload, most of your queries are running on one processor thread. They're not being parallelized. So if you don't have any storage or memory bottlenecks, that's your final bottleneck. How fast is that processor? And so this helps you figure out that this one is faster than this one. And you can use this when you're making sizing calculations or you're getting ready to consolidate or getting ready to virtualize. Instead of just guessing, you can use these kind of numbers to try to come up with something that makes some sense. So that's how that works. And then, to go with that, I have an Excel spreadsheet that you guys will get that just shows one page of the Intel Broadwell family where I, what I've done here, and if I scroll over to the left, these are hyperlinks to the Intel Arc database for each one of these SKUs. And you can see there's 22 different SKUs in the family. And then these are how many cores and how many sockets and how many total physical cores. And these are all in calculations. It's not hard coded. So I go through and do all the numbers here. And you can see the one with a hyperlink is the official score. And the rest of these are just my calculations. So this is the total score for the capacity and this is a score per core, right? So that's where these come from. I'm showing you the math and giving you an example of how to do it yourself. But if you want to do it for any other families, you're going to have to do the legwork. Because otherwise, that's like my too much work that I've done to just give you for free. So that's how that works. And this is something people asked before. Here's the numbers for the current generation processors. So you can see at the top, the Xeon Platinum 8280 is the flagship processor, and you can see the score per core and how many cores are in the system and the total score, and then the license cost for SQL Server Enterprise Edition if you bought a two-socket server with that processor in it. And if you look carefully there, you can see that some of these are better choices than others. And also, these are the best choices at each core count because Intel has this habit They'll release three or four or five processors with eight cores or 10 cores. And you're like, which one should I pick? Well, I've done it for you. These are the best ones. If it's not on this list, you're messing up. So those of you taking pictures, this is a good slide because if you're getting ready to buy a processor from Intel and it's not on this list, you are doing it wrong. And then even on this list, you can see some are better than others. So look. The 8268, the third one down, look at that compared to the 8270. It's almost identical for capacity, but quite a bit higher for performance. And the license cost is, what, $28,000 less. 
So that $28,000 would pretty much pay for that entire server. And you still have about the same capacity, and you have more performance. So that's how that works. I'm sorry? 2P means two processors. So this is the same thing for EPIC, because and there's actually an AMD EPIC result in TPCE. So I was able to use that to do the same thing for EPIC. And they have fewer SKUs, and they're not as complicated. So here's the same exact numbers for EPIC. And remember, this is for OLTP, where AMD still has a slight disadvantage. But you can still see that certain choices are better than others. So you want to have lower core counts and higher clock speeds if you can. Yes? That's the biggest you can get. Yeah. I mean, I could get the 6244, but I'd end up paying more for it for that, you know, slightly better single threaded clock. Yeah, the question is if I'm on standard edition, the biggest one I can get is the 6246, the third one from the bottom. That's true. I mean, you can go higher, but you're not going to be able to use all the cores, and Microsoft wants you to pay for them anyways, so that's not a good deal. So, yeah, keep that in mind. If you know you're on standard edition, don't let your admin or infrastructure people buy like a 6248 or something because you're going to have that problem. Yes? Um, a lot of times with customer environments, you start off with some cores and then eventually you outgrow it and they add more. Okay. In some of these cases that you show here, does it make more sense to say, no, build me a new VM with this other processor so you know you're going to get much better performance at the same number of yeah, Mike, the question is if you over outgrow your initial allocation, especially on a VM, it would make more sense maybe to have a new VM on a newer processor. It, it, mel it might. It just depends on the timing. But yeah, you do have more flexibility with VMs. So moving on here, a bad CPU choice versus a good CPU choice. This is an extreme example. But if somebody picked the top one, they're going to save $1,600 on the processor's cost but they're going to give up a huge amount of performance, and they're going to spend twice as much on the SQL Server licenses. So this is the most extreme example I could come up with, but I've seen people do this. So don't do this. Don't say, oh, I'm going to save a little bit of money by getting this silver processor, and look at what you give up. All right, so some future developments, because I'm almost out of time here. So this is the Intel Xeon Roadmap. And this shows where we're at right now is where you can see that Cascade Lake, second generation Intel scalable processor. Well, the next one, like I said before, is Cooper Lake that comes out probably in the middle of next year, and then Ice Lake, and then after that, Sapphire Rapids, and that's what's coming in the future. And then for Epic, they're gonna have Zen 3 and Zen 4. Zen 3 should come out in the middle of next year. So the next year is gonna be pretty exciting. And then here's Intel Optane. They're going to have second generation Optane both for PMEM and for storage next year. And the PMEM is going to be faster, and the Optane storage is going to have twice the capacity and be much faster. So I'm pretty excited about that. And then finally, I've got some articles. I write a lot of stuff for SQLPerformance.com. So here's some of my recent articles that talk about this sort of stuff if you want to learn more. And then here's some good references. I've written a whole bunch of stuff over the years on processor selection, and why it's important, and what you should think about. That's what that first one is. And then the Intel Arc database. And then the same thing for AMD. It's not quite as good. And then Serve the Home is a really good blog that does reviews of every new server processor and every new server system that comes out. And it's really a very good resource if you want to learn more about this stuff on your own and just keep up with what's going on in the industry. So please do a session evaluation. I really appreciate your feedback, and I really appreciate you all coming here, all the way over here. So yeah, that's it. I'm out of time. <laughs> and I'll take questions afterwards if you have any.